So in this episode, I sit down with a good friend of mine, Aaron. Now, Aaron is a very fascinating person, quite frankly, one of the most interesting people that I've ever had the privilege of getting to know. Now, she has a very interesting background. She started off as a kinesiologist or got a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology and then decided to study traditional Chinese medicine, all to answer this really fundamental question of why and what's the meaning. During this conversation, we actually talk about that, where Erin experienced an existential crisis in her childhood, which is quite unusual, but certainly profound. So like most of our conversations on this podcast, we cover a lot of ground, but I must say, and I, I don't know if I should choose favorites, but so far to date, this has been my absolute favorite conversation. The insights that Aaron provides and the amount of things that I learned during this episode are phenomenal. So I really hope you enjoy this wide ranging and also very in-depth conversation with Aaron. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much for taking the time to chat with me. And like I usually do, let's just start with uh, you telling a little bit about your story. Uh, what what originally got you interested in, in medicine? Okay. Huh. This story, I mean, I could go back very far. Um, to be honest, there was never a part of me that actually wanted to be in, in medicine, so to speak. So that's not what got me into mm. Chinese medicine. Um, what brought me into Chinese medicine was asking a question out of probably about age 10, even before that. Um, who am I? What is this life about? And why am I here? So that question was a real big driving force for me to go seeking for answers. By 15, mm. I, I grew up very... Catholic. And in that tradition, I felt a, a connection to something really sacred. And I, I really appreciated that exposure. As I got older, there were parts of both that that didn't resonate and oh, I wasn't finding answers. So at first, it was kind of seeking through um, different spirituality traditions. Um, why are we here? Who am I? Um, I wanted to, I started to study Buddhism on my own. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe I could find who I am if I examined the physical body to a really deep degree. And so when I entered high school, I fell in love with biology, the study of human anatomy, um, and just the examination of the, the human body thinking, well, maybe I can find answers if I examine the details, which led me to university to study kinesiology, which was an amazing program. Um, where I got the opportunity to actually work with cadavers, um, but never really finding answers. You know, I, I remember in one of my physiology labs, I put up my hand, we we're talking about the brain and the heart. And he was talking about how the brain signals to the heart and it causes the heart to, to beat. And then I put my hand up and I said, okay, but what tells the brain to tell the heart to beat? Well, of course, the... <laughs> The class went silent and the, the professor just said, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not talking about this. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to get my answers here. Um, then I was a really competitive athlete as well in, in university specifically. And, and I would play around a lot with my heart rate in terms of wearing heart rate monitors and breathing and learning to control my breath and watching you know, understanding that, wait a sec, I can actually lower my heart rate as I'm increasing power. And I thought that was kind of unique. I was like, okay, well, what is that? What is that in me that can do that? What aspect? So again, no answers. I was just playing around. Um, and then after university, I ended up actually just being a letter carrier for six years and loved it. Um, and it was my sister. She said, hey, do you want to go to school for Chinese medicine? And I thought this was so left field. I was like, okay. I, I mean, I, I, initially it was like, sure, I'll go. But it was more just to hang out with my sister and have a connection and, and learn something. I've always enjoyed learning. But I thought I better do some research. In the meantime, all this time I'm doing my own research in terms of different kinds of, um, not medicine, but more spirituality. So trying to find answers. Um, and 
so then when I when I looked up Chinese medicine and I started reading about it, they mentioned this word qi. Well, boom, there it was. It's like, oh, okay, that's the that's the thing I was trying to ask my professor in in school. It's like this invisible field of energy, these morphogenic fields that are or you could say electromagnetic fields to make it super simple, um, that were governing um, the physiology. So I was always kind of looking what what was what was governing the physical body. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go to Chinese medicine school to answer this question because I was still seeking it. So it was never, oh, I want to go and I want to be a doctor and I want to help people. Mind you, I love helping people, mm-hmm. but that wasn't the initial um, um, catalyst. And and then studying Chinese medicine, I was getting somewhere a little bit, um, understanding qi. But then again, working with qi, I still wasn't satisfied. And um, recognizing mm. that qi was nothing but a frequency, that everything was just frequency. And that led me into sound. And so I studied a, a system called Acutonics. Um, it's a certified program offered uh, out of New Mexico. Um, went through the training, became an instructor, became instru- a teacher of that. Um, I still not satisfied. I mean, this thirst, it's like, wait, it's still not, I still haven't, I still don't really truly understand. So I understood, but it was like, I wasn't satisfied yet. So then I actually went to the quantum university into their integrative um, medicine program, a PhD program. And it was there that I started to, I think my, my, my science mind, I have a very artistic spirit mind. And then I have this science mind that just wasn't satisfied. I love the idea of chi and all this, but it's like, but my left brain needed this actual science so that I could feel satisfied. Um, and so that's why I wanted to study quantum medicine because it's like, Oh, okay. Now this makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's what kind of got me into medicine. And, and ironically enough, like I love the clinical aspect. Um, but I find myself, um, thriving as a teacher as well. And that was a place I'd never thought, or an instructor, I never thought I'd end up in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the the brief story, (sighs) but it was this quest. There are so many tangents we could go down. Like (laughs) as as you were describing that about a million questions came to mind, I'm sure. But uh, I mean, I think that the, the thing that I had no idea about with yourself is how, how early that question started. Right. And that's, I, I believe that's pretty unusual for, for an 11 year old to be, to be asking these questions, you know, yeah. like, like who am I? These big philosophical questions. Right. I mean, most kids at 11 years old are, are like what's on TV next. Right. Oh. So that's, that's pretty profound to consider the fact that that that's kind of just baked right into your, your soul, right. From it I'm was. sure day one, it you was. probably even had that question prior to 11. It's just the first time maybe that, yeah. that came to some sort of our articulable, totally. yeah, that's the word articulable, yeah. uh, uh, way of conceptualizing. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's, it's fascinating. So, yeah. You know, I was at the zoo, uh, I was two years old and that's when it hit me. It was like, it was like a wave that hit me. I just remember, it, I don't even know what happened. I looked around, I thought, Holy smokes. Okay. Here I am. And what is my place in all of this? And then, so by 10, it was like, okay, what is this all about? Because a lot of it isn't making a lot of sense to me, which is fascinating because a lot of, a lot of my, my work, I could say that I, my deep love and passion has led me into the exploration of the soul, you know, and for a long time, I didn't even want to say that word. You know, because here I was, I didn't want, I I was a scientist. I came from like this really academic background and here I am saying, yeah, but what's the soul? And, and what is, what, how is the soul interfacing in the physical body? Um, And Mm. yeah. And so I was asking these really, I found, and I found in my life that if you ask the big questions, life will answer you, but it can maybe be a pretty hard road. Be careful what mm-hmm. you ask for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would completely agree with that. And yeah. uh I, I, I can't help but but think how many two year olds go through an existential crisis, you know, because that's basically what you were explaining or how I heard it anyways, you right. know, like that that's what the existential crisis is, is okay. who am I? What is this about? What place do we have in this? Exactly. And it's these these philosophical existential questions. Like, yeah. wow, yeah. two, that's 
That's impressive. Like oh. one that you remember it and two that it actually occurred at that point in time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what a life. Um, but maybe we can kind of dig into to some of the, the answers then, you know, mm-hmm. like like you've spent your entire life pursuing the answers of this. And it sounds mm-hmm. like you're maybe coming to some sort of answer or or am I off the mark here? No, yeah, no, very, very good. Um yeah, a big part of my research went into an energetic in Chinese medicine, as you know, the extraordinary vessels. Well, the last 19 mm-hmm. years has been a quest. Little did I realize that, you know, I didn't know what I was so excited about until I realized now what I was excited about in this. And what I was uncovering with them is, is okay, but in the, the ancients called them our evolutionary vessels, trauma vessels, extraordinary vessels. There's many names for them. Um, I like to call them soul vessels, um, understanding that each of these vessels, the Tao has said that there's eight rivers that come from the Tao or destiny or God or creation or whatever you want to say. And so, uh, you know, reading that as like, okay, these eight rivers lead us back to that place. And these eight rivers come out of that place. Um, and having just an intimate connection with them within my own self, um, working with clients, I come to realize, are these the wiring of the soul? It sure feels like that to me. Um, But Mm. what was interesting is in this deep exploration and and understanding of this, um, maybe maybe about five or six years ago, something really profound happened. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is who I am. These vessels are describing who I am. I was like, okay, I got pretty excited. I'm finally getting some answers. And then one night I was just laying around and then it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And it was the, the words went through me saying, those aren't you either. And, and honestly, Jess, it, it felt like I was going to have a heart attack. It felt like my whole reality, just everything mm. I was thinking I was started to unravel, 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 right. a completely destructive phase. You know, and thinking, oh, my God, what what is happening? Um, My body actually went into a little bit of shock because my whole reality just went like that. And it's like, okay, well, that's not that here I was Mm -hmm. identifying myself with this this aspect. Right. And then boom, gone. So it was brilliant because I realized, okay, you're none of that. Um, And so it took a while, but it was a I say that path was very destructive I'm recognizing that when we sign up to make that descent to the soul, it really is a destructive phase. I think the New Age community says it's, oh, it's all (laughs) light and should feel expansive and should feel good at all times when you're connecting to your authentic self. And I say our authentic self is the soul, and it actually is a very destructive phase because it's going to show you everything that you're not. And it'll keep unwinding until you find exactly yeah. connect to that place. That's that where all life comes from, that original nature. So the it Tao, was, right? yeah, so it was a, it was, it's, it, these, this search took me to a certain place and then I had to let it all go, um, you know, and just come be stripped down and, and then understand, mm. you know, connect to that, even that deeper aspect of, um, I don't know if that would be like a, I don't know what that space is, but whatever that space is, it's like, okay, that's where that's a a unified place. It feels um, stable there. The impermanence, I guess, or sorry, the permanent, that permanent thread that runs through all life where everything else is quite impermanent and and transitory. Including the extraordinary vessels. Yeah, I, I, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, all all terminology. The thing that that as as I'm hearing you explain this, I can't help but think of chapter one of Tao Te Ching, right? Like right. the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. Exactly. And and perhaps, you know, that, that's how I I in, intuitively felt that experience you described is you're defining this thing, you're coming up with an explanation of what soul is, about what existence is, about what I am yeah. is. Yeah. But if you can describe it in words, you know, in that left brain terminology, then it's not it. Exactly. I I remember when I was going through school, I I was so frustrated. Like there came this point in maybe my first year, maybe second year, but very early on. And I'm like, this is, 
This is absolute, complete nonsense. Like everything that's being spoken is make believe. Like yeah. none of this makes sense. Yes. There's a million contradictions. Yeah. I was so frustrated. And then it occurred to me, it's, it's, and the thing that I would often say, it's like, because what we're trying to do in, in Chinese medicine or in any medicine that acknowledges existence outside of the physical body totally. is it's like we're trying to say a poem using using mathematics and algebra yeah. it's like i'm sure it can be done yeah. but it's just not the same right and it's so hard to yeah. to describe that that uh disillusion of self that you felt that one mm-hmm. night when you were lying yeah. on the couch it's like how, how do words even come close to this right no you can't even and and you know and no. there's this aspect um yeah it turned life upside down and backwards um and and then the question is okay now what now what because everything yeah. that i now now how do you move from this place and then recognizing that in all of us lies this this stable permanent um infinite place and then everything else in life a thought an emotion um an idea of who you think you are it's transitory you know and so it it was it's Mm -hmm. like um understanding not choosing one or the other but understanding you're both that you're having a dynamic experience in the in the sea of infinity and and to enjoy both and there's dynamics in both Mm -hmm. and they have different languages (laughs) And what is it? Jung says that the the uh, mature mind is capable of of existing in paradox. That's it. You know that both of these things are are completely opposite yet simultaneously completely true. Exactly. And I think that's such a challenging thing to consider is the fact like how can both of these be true because they are opposite. Exactly. But part of it is is living in that. Like there comes that point when, in in my similar experiences, which of course they're every di- everyone is different. Yeah. When you do have that question, like, well, then what? You know, if I'm none of this, totally. if if there's no word, if there's no definition, if I can't conceptualize what I am and all I can do is feel it, yeah. then what am I? Like, right. what do you do with that? Right. Like, how do you go on living? Exactly. Really? Exactly. But then you have to go on living and, and they're both coexisting simultaneously. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of like keeping one toe in, in both realms. And I'm not sure if you've yes. you've encountered individuals like this in our, our sort of sphere yes. of new agey, semi-new, whatever it is, mm-hmm. but people who are like all in and they just only want to exist in this realm of non-existence, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and in TCM we'd say their Shen is just like gone. gone. You know, those spirits aren't in the vessel. That's right. How do you consolidate that? Like uh, it, yourself, how do you consolidate this reality that we've got these these different spirits yes and if we were to anthropomorphize them and give them personalities and characteristics just for the ease of discussion yeah it's like we've got these different aspects of self that are all wanting yes different things all have different intuitive poles how do you consolidate that like what's your practice like to to keep those aspects of self in harmony if that question made sense no total sense you know uh it it took me a long time to get language for a lot of this as as you probably know from your experience it's like wow like there's okay there is no language so now okay everything i thought i was i wasn't and now i'm coming from a different viewpoint um what i recognize is you know and i use the word multi-dimensional that we have these places we have these three places in in the body called called the three treasures Jing Qi Shen. It's like consciousness can move to the, so, you know, different traditions will say upper world, middle lower world, lower world. And, and we exist in all three. And I really believe that I get really excited in, in the, in the work that I see in, in clinic and working with students is we're in this huge evolutionary time where our capacities are waking up and it's a little bit foreign. And so it's like, we're having these different experiences. And so there's a time and place to be in the upper world. And that would be kind of more that transcendental back to unity kind of place. And then the middle world, you know, this is where we pay our bills and do our life. And then the lower world, well, that to me is like, now we're getting in touch with the soul. And, and 
unfortunately, I find a lot of people who are kind of in that upper world, they think that that's, they've found themselves. And they haven't. It's like in Chinese medicine, we say for you to know yourself, the Shen actually has to, you have to reverse the light behind your eyes and take the journey down mm. and down into the, the waters below and have the light meet the waters. And in that, you will find your, your Tao, your destiny, and what it is, your sole purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that was the biggest thing for myself was, um, and reading, you know, different um, authors who, you know, depth psychologists who talk about um, the summoning of the soul. You know, and what does that actually mean when your soul summons you from below? But in Chinese medicine, it's saying the same thing, that whisper comes from below. So it's taking that journey down below. Um, mm -hmm. What I have found, yeah, there is a lot of people who are not even wanting to be embodied. But just my sense of that is the body um, is a memory stick of the past. The body is an expression of the subconscious mind. And so for people who are really having a hard time being in the body, it's because the body will hold the trauma. The body holds the memory. And, and so it, it's, it's getting really challenging. A lot of my practice is let's just step you back in. You know, if you want to go further out, you got to go further yeah. out. And so it's, it's been, a, and especially being in the sound world, you know, um, watching them sound is powerful. It is powerful medicine. And I've watched a lot of abuse and misuse with it. Um, and it can take people completely out. Mm. Um, and then they'll just stay there. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I think we're at a time mm -hmm. where the idea of expansion and trans transcendence is beautiful. The harder journey is coming back and being embodied and walking in this world. But as you say, between the worlds. And understanding it, it is a walk yeah. between the worlds and, and that this is our evolution to know that we're both and we're in this world. And we also have access to, I say, the, the vertical pillar. <laughs> we're walking a horizontal line, mm -hmm. but we also have access to a vertical pillar that you can drop into at any time. But you don't have to use it to escape because mm -hmm. that's a different thing. Yeah. I think that's a super important thing because I, I definitely see a lot of, of that in, in this realm is using the, the, the spiritual realm as an excuse for whatever behavior or to not deal with what's happening, like the logistical stuff that's happening or poor behavior. Totally. And what's, what's interesting is in, in my journey to kind of, I spent so much time trying to get there through the, the, the classic means meditation and going on these retreats. And, yeah. you know, like I, I spent my, my, my walkabout as Eric calls, you know, like I, like I did all these things just to try and get into that, that higher realm of existence. And I would touch it like every once in a while I would touch it. But what I found fascinating is what ended up happening. And for me, it was, it was an injury mm -hmm. and I was in so much pain. Yeah. Like I, I and one of those other things you just can't even describe unfathomable pain mm -hmm. where the, the idea of trying to pursue some sort of mm -hmm. spiritual enlightenment, like yeah. no, that was so far from, but funnily enough, it was when I was forced into my body, yes. when it was an inescapable yes. existence, yeah. that's when I started to spend longer and longer durations. That's not even a proper way of saying it, where I started to encounter that vertical pole yeah. much more regularly is when I was in the body. Yes. And then learn through that experience, I, I for one learned that the access point to that other realm yeah. is this. Yeah. Like yeah. this is how we get there. This Absolutely. is what the universe blessed us with is we've got this vessel yes. that is the doorway totally. to that other realm. Totally. Absolutely. You yeah. nailed it. The ancients would talk about there's a, a tiny space in the heart. It was in Sufism, I think, the Sufis. We have the sacred space of the heart, but then there's a tiny space of the heart. And if you access that place, then you have access to all the all the different uh, dimensions and and beyond this, you could say, light spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, very similar yeah. experience uh, when I in 2019, um, I got really sick with Epstein Barr, um, and and mm -hmm. unfortunately at the time I was I think I was yeah I was 42 turning 43, and my I didn't have Epstein Barr as a kid, and and so Epstein Barr in a forty year old's body doesn't go well. 
Um, and it, it, it sent me to the edge of, of almost death and very similar to your story. Um, and this also turn, turned everything upside down in terms of what does health and medicine actually mean. So here I was, the, mm-hmm. again, the, a physical pain, kind of like you described, like I it would push me to an edge. And again, being a competitive cyclist, you're pushing yourself to these edges all the time. But this was next level. And there was no escaping it. It was actually forcing me in the, like it was pulling me in the body. I could feel it. And um what happened to me after kind of the crisis moment of it, as I was kind of coming out of it. So I ended up with paralysis and a whole bunch of other things. Um, I was really sick, physically sick, but something happened to my inside. Something happened on the inside and it was the most peaceful, not ecstatic, not excited, just this sense of complete peace because the only thing what this illness taught me was to completely let, I had no choice but to let go and stop fighting the pain, you know, to fight the pain. It was getting worse. And so it was teaching me to yeah. surrender and let go. What was so it fascinating to me is even though my physical body was dying, I felt the most healthy in my entire life. And that it was so again, paradoxical. Wow. It was like, what the heck? What? This is the most whole, the most peaceful, the most serene the most connected I have ever felt in my entire life. And yet my physical body was just wasting away. And in that moment, and again, that turned my whole idea of what is health and health to me was at that point, health is not the absence of disease, not the absence of symptoms. You know, as healthcare workers are like, let's get rid of your symptom. Let's get rid of your, you know, and get you well again. To me at that moment, health, was that inner feeling that I was able to connect with that sense of peace and wellness because when you're in that space you can handle whatever if you're gonna die you're gonna die you're okay because you've entered this place Mm -hmm. of such acceptance and so coming out of that is like well now how can I how do I show up in the treatment room because I don't want to just fix a symptom that's not where I'm pointing people so it changed my whole practice in terms of how do I start to point people to that place of wholeness? That pl- You know, it's interesting the word health comes from the word wholeness. So that sense of you're not separate, that sense of you have a place inside of you that's already complete, was never broken, yeah. um, without dismissing what they're coming in with. Like, again, it's holding both, right? It's like, hey, you have a sore shoulder, okay. And also I can see you in your wholeness. And... And so it, it, it really threw me for a loop. I was like, how am I going to show up in this, in this role as a, as a doctor? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> when the whole principle of yeah. healing and facilitating yeah. healing is just, it's completely upside down. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I can certainly relate to that. Yeah. Like I, I can't help but consider the transformation that occurs when somebody is dealing with any, any type of injury or illness, be it, devastating and life-threatening or you know a sprained ankle totally it's like any anytime the vessel isn't doing what we want it to do you know like the, the conscious mind is oh, like yeah. do this thing and the body's like i can't like can't. it's not happening totally. we're confronted with this level of reality that again is inarguable yes and it it forces perception and concept of self and identity to to change and what I see as a major obstruction to healing mm-hmm. is when that inner transformation mm-hmm. doesn't occur. Right. I've even seen the fact that if that inner transformation doesn't occur, the, the physical body can heal completely, and yet yeah. there's still dysfunction. The shoulder right. still isn't moving. The ankle still isn't moving. That's right. Even though it's technically healed. That's right. So I, I completely agree with you. After having gone through these massive transformative things, it's, it's challenging it to show up in clinic and right. not see everything as this opportunity to to kind of shift perceptions right totally totally and and what i yeah so what i recognize is you know even taking all this stuff about quantum quantum theory and and that kind of thing you know instead of i mean this is going to sound really out there but i may as well just go there um as I was, as I was healing and, and, and having this moment of just complete surrender and acceptance of what was, and because of that, 
experiencing this deep sense of peace. Um, I also could feel Jess, and I call it an organizing principle, and I don't even know why I call it that, but I could feel that something bigger was working on me. That's something that I, that it was hilarious. It was really sweet. I had, because being in the field that we're in, you know, we have all your friends who are healers saying, oh, do this and let me help you with this and let me give you treatments. <laughs> Everything in me was like, don't touch me. You know, not because, because I could yeah. feel this bigger presence. That I call it an organizing principle, just kind of working through me. And I thought, no, your tuning fork, your needle, your herb, it's all really great stuff, but it's not it, like it's, it's peanuts compared to what's working through me right now. So don't touch. And, and so mm -hmm. again, showing up in the treatment room is like understanding that there is a, an organizing principle of life. Uh, I look at nature, there's an organization there, I look at the human body and working with chi, there's organization. There's a force out there. We call it chi or life force energy um, that is much bigger and much grander than any of the tools that I have available to me. So again, humbled. Yeah. And now how do I show up and not interrupt that life force energy? Because it is working through all of us at all times. And I think it took my physical body to... I wonder almost, too, like... Go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but there was yeah. yeah. I'm just I'm curious about the fact. Like I completely agree with this this idea that there's this organizing force, and and it, it happens when one is in harmony with nature. I mean, going back to to Taoist principles, that's one of the principles: live in harmony with nature, right? And what I'm what I'm curious about, and as you described your experiences, I, I couldn't help but feel that's that's a body and soul in harmony with nature. Totally. It doesn't require an external intervention no. because it's in harmony with nature. Yeah. So, I mean, that's amazing that you've, you've lived a life, you know, such a way that that's how that experience unfolded. Yeah. But my curiosity is also, perhaps that's, that's the art of being in the treatment room is yeah. to use the right tool for the job to gently tap somebody closer to harmony with nature exactly. if, if that makes sense you know i think about you with your your tuning forks and your yeah. sound yeah. like isn't that ultimately what it's doing is Absolutely. not trying to fix anything yeah. but just trying to re-resonate the it. the individual's souls with nature totally. you you nailed it all the tuning forks that uh i use are either the frequency of earth dynamics so either the rotation of the earth on its axis or the rotation of the earth around the sun or around the zodiac sign so everything works in cycles our whole system you know part of that organizing principle is all about cycles and like and you can see it oh like life is a cycle it's just and you can is it a cycle or is it a spiral you know and i say life is more of like a spiral it's an evolutionary spiral um, but it rotates and anything that rotates has a sound, has a frequency. All of the, I mean, we just know, and you, you know, look at the moon, the time of the full moon, even Western doctors will say the time of the full moon, my God, emergency is crazy. Dentists will say faces are swelling mm. with pus coming out of them at the time of the full moon. Um, our bodies, you know, the tides change. Our bodies are 70, 80% water. Of course, we're going to. Her tides change, Mother Earth's tides change, so do ours. Um, and so we're deeply connected. We don't, you know, it seems so far away, but all of these planetary bodies, including Mother Earth, we are deeply affected with all of those um, heartbeats. And when, when some, and as we go through life and we have our hard knocks, which is part of life, we do get out of resonance with nature, outer nature and inner nature. And the sound is just mm -hmm. really reconnecting a person back, honestly, to their inner nature. And when you have that, you're in right relationship. So it's getting everything into, like, right relationship. Mm -hmm. when, when you have people in, in session with you and you, you bring out your tuning forex, do you ever come across somebody who has, like, a visceral opposition to a particular frequency? <laughs> Yes, I had, uh, oh, it was hilarious. So I have the tuning, so I, I have planetary forks as well. Um, one of my favorite sets is water right now. I have a water set and I'm really obsessed with water right now. But um, I had this one client and 
Um, anytime I would bring out Venus. So Venus represents in terms of our psyche. So another word for psyche is soul. So all the planets kind of correspond to different aspects of our psyche or soul. And Venus is the, more the feminine principle. So we have Earth and then Mars and Venus on either side of Earth. So yin and yang. And so the duality, it's like, oh, we came here to understand polarity, yin and yang, masculine, feminine principles, and what happens when we merge them. Um, and uh, I had this one client, uh, girl, lady, and dancer, and very, like, very feminine, but her energy was extremely masculine, extremely. So presented very feminine, but the energy, she really adopted that really... Um, almost aggressive masculine energy. <laughs> and so, and she had a lot of inflammation in her body. Well, one of the, the things that Venus does, the Venus aspect, um, not only on a, for our psyche is more the feminine aspect, the, uh, the idea of beauty, art, receiving, um, but it's also an anti-inflammatory. And she was full of inflammation. So really aggressive, very um, masculine and, did not want to touch any kind of feeling or vulnerability. And Venus is that aspect in all of us, is, is that more vulnerable side. So I would bring the Venus fork out to work on her um, inflammation in her body to begin with. Well, as soon as she would hear that, hear it, she would say, don't, whatever that is, take it off of me now. Even though that is exactly what her system was crying out for, what it showed me is, is just her resistance to her own feminine aspect, her own feminine nature right? That female energy, mm. her, that, the yin aspect. There was a some kind of resistance in her psyche where when it would come close to her, she's like, forget it. So she still, so her body was presenting with that inflammation. So absolutely, I've had that. I think that was the only time someone said, get that sound off of me. But it was, it was great, great information for me, right? In terms of what she was working with on a more subconscious level. And of course, her body was presenting it as inflammation. And do you find do you find the opposite is true as well? That mm -hmm. you get people come in and they're like, "Get give me the give me the earth to fork." That's like I don't want nothing with the earth. Do you ever have that as well? The I I can tell it, what I love about um, working with sound, Jess, is you know it's like I'm creating I'm I'm playing the sound of their soul and they're able to hear it. And so based on their physical, mental, emotional, mm. or spiritual um, resonances, I choose the forks based on all those things and plays those sounds. And that's actually the, the harmony of their soul in that time. This is what the sound, this is the music their soul needs to come back into right relationship. Um, and absolutely, like, yeah. people love Jupiter. Love, Jupiter's expansive, it's hopeful, it's joy. Um, you put that on the body and yeah, you can just, um, feel it. But I, I usually most people, most people are just super receptive, you know, to, to all the sound. I remember the first time I ever had Acutonics, it was from you and yeah. this was gosh, 10, A 10 or more ago. years ago or so. <laughs> and to this day, I don't like needles. Never, never have. Like no. it's such a strange thing as an acupuncturist, but I don't like them. <laughs> um, every time I have needles in, I just be like, yeah, yeah. get them out of me. Oh. But the first time I had Acutonics, it was like I was asleep in, in seconds. Yeah. You know, like I, I had rarely, if ever, experienced such yeah. such a state. And I can't say like a state of relaxation or or, or define it mm -hmm. in any way. Just mm -hmm. such such a unique state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, in the 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 intervening years between that and now, yeah. lots has happened. Yes. We we talked about a lot of things that have happened. Yeah. Um, so if we can kind of just step back to to part of that. I, my, my curiosity took us in one direction, but I would like to yeah. veer back and really understand what exactly changed then in your approach. Because you described, you know, like you went through this huge, right. massive shift. How, how do you treat? Like what has changed in your approach? Right. Really great. Um, and you probably know this too, you know, you're, you're many years out of school and and our practice changed, you know, when we're in, in school, we learn to do differentiation of syndrome. Okay, that's one way to do it. And I don't throw it away. I still use it. But it's turned more into a combination of really listening. I think over the years, I've gotten really in touch with 
every fork so well. Um, and every fork represents something on a physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual or soul level that I don't ever know really what I'm going to be doing until I get in there. And then it's more like I hear it. It's like, yeah, they need a little bit of this sound. And I just mm -hmm. know. Um, and then I, my logical mind can come in and I can like make sense of it all. And it just validates it for me when I don't trust. Yeah. But how it's changed for me, because it was, it was real. Like it was really challenging. It was like, how am I going to go back to this? Knowing, <laughs> knowing what I've just experienced and knowing nothing can really stand in the face of this organizing principle. So how can I show up and respect the organizing principle and still be, a part of, and I, I call it setting the stage, setting the stage for that remembrance, setting the stage for that harmony again. One thing that um, has changed is I'm not there to fix them. You know, I think this is always a thing that I've always known. I'm not there to fix them. I'm there to set a stage, but I'm not exerting any of my will on them. No personal will is now coming into it because mm. there's this, I know I'm just there to respect this organizing principle, whatever that is. Um, and to be really honest, most of the treatment I'm actually doing on myself. So you're going to say, what? I'm working on them, but I'm actually doing all the, the, I use a lot of inner vision. So, which is light. And I use a lot of feeling. Each extraordinary vessel that that I work with, um, all eight of them in my journey with them, each of them has I call a soul frequency. So what? Where I was coming up, this is why I was getting frustrated with Chinese medicine, with the five element system. It's like we only, it's only giving us a handful of emotions to work with. And so, for example, every week someone's coming in with anger, move a little of her chi, they feel good for a couple of days, and then they're back on the table with more anger. And it's like, well, that's well, I'm not giving consciousness or spirit a, a, a doorway to move into. And that's where over all these years, the extraordinary vessels revealed to, to me that there's also emotional correspondences to them that actually do that inner alchemical transformation. So, for example, the, you know, the, if you take anger and you take it to the very extreme in terms of the laws of intertransformation, it's going to transform into its opposite, which is, is forgiveness. Someone coming in angry, you can't say feel gratitude. It's not a, a vibrational match. You know, someone coming with deep fear, you don't just say feel hopeful. No, you got to, fear is the invitation to trust. That's one of your extraordinary vessels. So when I'm working with the vessels and doing this alchemical work, I'm not imparting it on them. I'm doing it in myself and making myself the tuning fork, right. making my system coherent so that in terms of their system um, can start to resonate with this system. So I'm really just doing work on myself. So I become mm -hmm. the biggest tuning fork resonator in the room. And it looks like I'm doing a little bit of work on them and it feels good. <laughs> but my, my teacher yeah. had said to me, he said, Aaron, the sound stands in place where we forgot spirit. So until we remember those aspects of our soul, we're going to need the, the, the sounds to remind us. So they're just bridges mm -hmm. for now. I mean that makes that makes complete sense, mm -hmm. um, particularly when we uh, conceptualize our, our reality as frequencies. Right. It reminds me a lot of, of uh, heart math. So I went through the heart math yeah. training, and, and it talks all about coherence. And yeah. what it essentially says is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. In order to facilitate change in somebody else, you first have to create that change in yourself. Right. Yeah. That's what's creating the change. Yes. The tools that we have, the needles, the forks, the bowls, the massage, the whatever it is, that that's that's great. That's right. but without that inner state, yes, the the coherence is not nearly as profound, right? Not at all. And, you know, you, you said it, and I was going to mention an incredibly incredibly brilliant wise woman once said, "We are the biggest tuning fork in the room," right? And yeah. of course, that was you. Yeah. That has stuck with me for <laughs> years and years because yeah. it's so very true yeah. that. It's, it's our ability to, to step totally. in that state of coherence. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. And then finding as, as practitioners, what do you do? Those ways. What do you do to get yourself there? Yeah. Really great. Um, well, I use in, you know, every, every session now I look as truly it's, it's a, 
for myself, it is such an honor to work with people on this level. Um, I find that each session is like a ceremony or a prayer in a way. And so it's a really sacred mm. container. And, and all I'm doing is um, setting the stage for a prayer and how, and the prayers in sound for me. So it just comes out as music. Um, but how do I set, set myself into that place? Um, I do a, a process. Uh, it was developed by my teacher. It's using the eight extra, his name's Ron Laplace and an amazing, amazing teacher. Um, and he's more into sacred geometry, but he's the one who got me into sound as well. He was my teacher of sound. And he developed this uh, tuning fork protocol um, using the Fib using the Fibonacci, and the Fibonacci is basically just a ratio that nature uses to create in this reality, in this dimension, and um, and so it uses all eight extraordinary vessels eight times, and each of the vessels corresponds to a certain feeling: self love, trust, forgiveness, compassion, faith, gratitude, truth, reverence, humility. And as I go through, it's a 64 step process, which is how many patterns are in the I Ching and how many codons of the DNA. So as I go through the 64 step process with it, I am feeling those feelings through my own system 64 times. That's how I begin the treatment. Um, and that gets me into this complete, uh, what I feel, I mean, I, I feel in my own system, that's what gets me into that zone, you know, and I know, you know, <laughs> when you get there mm -hmm. yeah you can just feel it it's like, and so that sets sets me up and then that, then from there i do the rest of the treatment and you do that once you enter the treatment room you you incorporate your own um getting into the zone we'll call it your own your own centering maybe is a better word mm -hmm. you incorporate that into the treatment room or does that happen prior to the session prior to the session yeah i mean i go through a whole you could say little ritual as well like i um, I'm just so fortunate to live out in trees and in nature. So I go through a whole like morning routine. It's not like I can just show up and get in that space. Like I'm, I'm doing a little exercise routine in the morning and just getting myself in a space just to take on the day, whether I actually, to be honest, whether I'm in clinic or not, this is just part of my, my day, right. you know? And, um, yeah. and I find it just, yeah, to, to get myself in that place for the day, the day changes. If I don't, it's palpable. It's like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh. So it's interesting because being in the treatment room has really taught me as a practitioner that how I help my clients is by, is by tuning this system. This is the biggest, this is the biggest gift I can give not only my clients, but people that I interact with within the day. And, and my world and understanding alchemy that this idea that, you know, Hermes said, as within, so without. So to create outer change, you have to create inner change first. And I really hold that dear to my heart, you know, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, with what's going on in the world. It's so easy to say, how am I going to change things out here? And I feel like, OK, my responsibility is creating, making sure I'm doing my inner housekeeping. And, and cleaning up and, and if there's war out here well there's war in here and can I can I make that peace again um, and so understanding those principles I, I love alchemy <laughs> and understanding those principles I'm like well that is my responsibility is is this inner housekeeping because this inner yeah. creates the outer yeah so checking in mm -hmm. I can't help but feel that that has a more profound effect as well mm -hmm. you know I I, I think of of in interaction with a child you know as close to a a um, raw soul mm -hmm. as we can get and mm -hmm. and when you interact with a child if you if you want them to get want to get them to do something mm -hmm. you can tell them to do something mm -hmm. and that might get them to do the do it you can show them how to do something yes. um or you can do something with them That's right and and the closer we get to embodying the action that we yes. want to see in others and doing that action yeah. the more likely that is to change Huge. and what i what i'm now finding myself curious about is of course you're you're a teacher and educator mm -hmm. whatever term we want to put on it and have you gone through these experiences and knowing how almost impossible it is to articulate the process of transformation that occurs in a treatment room. I mean, you did 
great justice to it in this conversation. Yeah. But describing to somebody or trying to teach somebody how to do that, mm-hmm. I can only imagine how challenging. Mm-hmm. So what do you do as an educator? How do you, how do you help? Now we'll move away from clients. How do you help yeah. students develop this capacity within themselves? Really great. I, you know, being in Chinese medicine, unfortunately, the schools right now, they just, there's two facets to Chinese medicine, outer tradition and inner tradition. And all we learned in school and and what I'm, you know, teaching the school is more the outer traditions. So more medically based. But there's this whole other facet to Chinese medicine, which is this inner tradition, which is called Nadan, inner alchemy. And that's what you're talking about is transformation, this inner transformative process. And Chinese medicine was actually a medicine for inner transformation. Um, I'm fortunate enough, enough in, in the Chinese medicine school to teach the eight extraordinary vessels. And in that, I talk about that to a point, but I still have to get them ready for an exam. But what I have done is, is yeah. because I'm so fascinated with, yeah, this idea of taking the deep dive behind the eyes and, and touching into that, taking, you know, listening to the soul. What is it asking you to do? Um, what is his name? James Hollis. He's a depth psychologist. And he said, he talks about the summoning of the soul. And he says, you know, a depression, you have to make sure it's not a biological thing. But oftentimes a depression in someone's life is the energy is coming, is retracting. Because the soul is wanting to be born further into, be, be, come online. And for that to happen, the energy retracts from life. And so all of a sudden, things that used to feel really good, they don't fit anymore. And then people get depressed. And he said, this is amazing because right. this is because the soul is, is asking you to listen. And it's, it needs to retract the energy so that you can go in and, and listen to what it's asking for you to do. How does nature want to work through you? Instead of what do I want to do? It's like, what am I in service for? And, and that's the change from, like, you could say, like, an egocentric. And Bill Plotkin talks about ecocentric. How does nature want to work through you? And so I get really excited because I find these eight vessels. Um, they guide that, that inner transformation. There's eight pathways, you know. And, and all the mystics would talk about, if you're going to take that journey behind the eyes, you need to have maps. Because it can get really confusing. <laughs> You know, and it can get scary. And what do you do? Yeah. When you, yeah, when you hit up against certain things, and and there's different phases to to transformation. You know, this idea of um, mm-hmm. caterpillar going into a cocoon. The cocoon, the caterpillar dissolves into nothing but soup. It's a cosmic mess, and it's a, just a cosmic soup in there. It's naughty. It's nothing. That is a huge part of inner transformation, and it's extremely uncomfortable. And it's interesting that cosmic or that 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 mess of that soupy mess that's in the cocoon, it's a bunch of cells called imaginal cells. And these fascinating that they're called imaginal cells. It's imagining something different, but you have to be okay with the dissolution. So people sometimes say, "I transformation isn't a you could say soul birth." or soul initiation is not going to make you feel better. It's actually going to make you feel worse. Your life, <laughs> do you want to, you know, your life is going to crumble. Everything you thought that fit won't fit. The beauty of it is you're going to find your soul is the mechanism inside you. That is the meaning making machine. This is where you're going to find your meaning and your purpose. Mm-hmm. That's really true to your nature where it will make sense. But it's a bit of a it's a bit of a process, and 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 according to this, um, I've been reading this book by Bill Plotkin, and he's like, there's not enough elders in the communities to to even be helping people facilitate this kind of um, soul initiation, and so. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm fascinated by it, um, and so what I've done is I just teach classes out just my own workshops to talk about the idea of transformation and how to begin to help yourself and also see when clients are going through it because in my opinion COVID was a catalyst for this you know COVID was a catalyst where it was an initiation point where it's like when we came back out for a lot of people it's like my life just doesn't fit it's not the same but I don't know what is so it was an initiatory phase 
and I get excited. I mean, it's uncomfortable, like as a alchemist and someone who loves transformation, it's like, hey, this is amazing what's happened. As you were describing that, I couldn't help but notice uh, how often you would you referred to you you listen you hear so you used a lot of auditory language <laughs> and I mean may, maybe it's part of just that's that's your field right the whole the whole sound world yeah. but when you say you you listen for that inner voice or mm-hmm. you can you can hear it mm-hmm. I think back to I, I grew up in a very Christian home right um, and. I remember going to church and hearing people talk about the voice of God and right. listening to the voice of God. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I can't listen any harder. Like my ears are open. I, I can hear a dog barking eight blocks away, but I can't hear this voice of God you're talking right. about. Yeah. And that image came up as well as you were describing. You just, you listen and you hear. Yeah. And what is, what is it you're listening for? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the, so the soul, it, it speaks to us in different ways. It speaks to us through images. So when I say hearing, it's not less necessarily a word I'm hearing. I'm hearing an image or seeing, and then I translate that into a sound, you know, and then into a language. Um, so it's yeah, images, it. um, feelings, dreams, and also um, something that I've become very attuned to in my system. Um, I feel like a... I follow the golden thread, if that makes any sense. It feels like, okay, I have this golden thread inside of me. And it kind of like feels things. And this to me is my soul. It's like, okay, it feels things. And when it feels aligned, that's what I say. When I say I'm hearing it, that's, that's the voice I'm listening to is that golden thread. Mm -hmm. It's like, yep, this is, this is the next step. Um, and, and then it's like an embodiment thing. Totally. Yeah, Absolutely. And so when I say hearing the voice, it doesn't necessarily come as a, a voice. I think what happens just for myself is it's a, a feeling, um, that golden thread feeling is like, yeah, okay. Um, and then sometimes it's images. So I'll get an image and it'll be like a mythical image, you know, like um, today I had an image of the whale show up. I was shoveling the walks and then out of nowhere, boom the vision of this whale shows up and I'm like, okay, I got it. I, I hear you. And, and then just reading about what does whale, I work with a, a Cree elder here. And so we work with animals as archetypes and, and that kind of thing. And so looking up what the, 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 the message of the whale and it's like, okay. And I, you know, and in some way though, Jess, it's like when you just listen, when I saw the image of the whale, I knew what the whale was already. It sounds so silly, but I knew what the whale was saying, you know? And, and so it's, it's just being, and then dreams, you know, dreams is another place where the soul will really try to connect. So just getting sensitive. Yeah. With it. yeah I, I think that's, that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. And my understanding of the, the unconscious and it's, it's not a great word to use mm-hmm. for the realm that we're discussing, but mm-hmm. it'll suffice for now. You know, the, the unconscious, the spirit realms. Yeah way of communicating is is not through words no. and that was a hard lesson for me to to realize it's not a language no. and listening is the best word we have for it yeah. but the imagery the the yeah. visuals the visual symbolism that occurs in dreams or these random daydreams or oh. just things that pop into your mind out of nowhere i think those are unbelievably important to listen Huge. to and dreams in particular, you know, the, the night dreams, like like the, the knowledge that can be extracted from a profound dream. I also believe we have a lot of just like brain doing brain things, oh. dreams, you know, just whatever. But there's no question, like sometimes you wake up and you're like, there's something there. That wasn't just a regular dream. You're, yes. you're, you're like drawn into it. Yes. That's, that's, in my opinion, the spirit realm or the unconscious speaking in its language, which is, is symbols and symbols. visuals. Yeah. And what I find fascinating is I've worked with a lot of clients doing dream interpretation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, they want to, like, know, know the book. Like, hey, what book do you recommend for dream interpretation? Yeah. Uh, what, what should I look at? And I'm like, don't, no. don't. It's no. not going to help you not because your unconscious is communicating to you in the symbols that you already understand. Totally. So it's a matter of having an open discussion with aspects of yourself to try and parse apart those symbols, exactly. right? Exactly. Do you find something similar? 
Huge, huge. I um, I worked with this lady um, down in New York. Her name's Catherine Shainberg. And she works, so she, it's a, it's, she has a school called the School of Images. And so um, through kind of the many years working in energy medicine and then the deep dives in my own personal life and answer, trying to ask the big questions, of course I was getting images and, but not fully understanding like what was happening. It's like, whoa, like what's, what's this and what's this? And, and then just randomly synchronistically, um, I find her through another friend and, and I'm in her workshop and, and, um, the workshop is, she takes us into, I, I won't say like a hypnosis, but definitely the, I could feel the brain waves, I guess a bit of a hypnotic state. She just gets us relaxed and then takes us back into our, our visual field, we should say. And she kind of takes us through a journey in terms of images. And her tradition, actually, it's, it's fascinating. It was Pat's an oral tradition from Jesus inner circle in terms of how to connect to your soul. And it's just orally passed down. She's the last in that lineage now. And she's in her 70s or 80s. Um, so it was just a real honor to sit with her. Yeah. And, and it's all about mm -hmm. the subconscious mind. How do you access it? How do you get into, you could say, I mean, this, and you know, I think from your studies, like your subconscious mind is like the hard drive of the computer. It's running the show. So how do we get access in there? Yeah. And, and so we can under, we have more online and it's not governing our life, but we actually can get in there and, and clean up some of the, you know, reprogram. And, but it's all done in her work. It's all done through images. Mm -hmm. And, and she would say like, before you go to bed tonight, tell yourself you're going to have a dream and that you want a few messages. Ask, ask the question, go to sleep, wake up and record your dream. And the dream isn't to be interpreted in a book. It can be only interpreted by the person itself. It, you know, it's just working with it. You mm -hmm. know, and, and then pulling out different aspects of the dream and saying, okay, what, you know, just writing in a journal. Okay, what, what does this actually mean? And then, and then, and then answering your own question because it's your, your, your information for yeah. you. There was a book by um, Robert jo Johnson, Ro Robert Johnson, I think. Okay. It's called Inner Work. It's just a tiny little little guy, um, and it's got to be one of my all-time favorite books because he talks a lot about dream interpretation and the the idea of of doing freeform writing to interpret a dream. It, I, I find it very cathartic and helpful. Mm -hmm. um, however, and this is likely just due to my my personality, maybe not though. Is is having some sort of structure in place has yes. also been quite helpful. Yes. You know, like just follow these steps as you go through this free form writing. It's like not here's what this symbol means. Right. It's here's a method behind interpreting right. this symbol. I found that so helpful yes. in my own dream interpretations and working with uh, my patients and clients as well. Yeah. Just this semi-structured step-by-step process. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it makes sense because the yeah. it's like the left, that structure again is the container, right? That left brain that needs that just so it can relax. You know, I find if I give myself my that left brain, just give it the structure and a little bit of science that it needs, then okay, I can finally let go and relax. <laughs> so, which is really good. I mean, that's yin and yang, right? Oh, yeah. I, that makes complete sense yeah. because if we if we exist too much just in this right. image realm of image, that's a dream, and oh. they don't make sense. Totally. But then if we sit down and we try and crack open the book about what it means, that also doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it is this this balance of creating some sort of structure for the art to exist totally. on you know like you you can't paint a beautiful picture without concrete supplies exactly. canvas paint things like that like yeah. all, all art has to be this beautiful balance between Absolutely. the physical reality the the yang energy totally. and the the intuitive sense of the yin energy totally yeah without you know for a lot of the creatives that i see will say okay they have a lot of venus in them you know, so v again, Venus is that aspect, that really artistic right brain side, but they can't do a damn thing with it. They're just in creative la la land. Oh, I have an, and, but they'll say I can't manifest because yeah. they need the structure, which is Saturn, which is like structure and groundedness and being in time and going through the linear process. And so to combine, you know, Saturn mm -hmm. and Venus can be really helpful for these creatives who are just like full of creative ideas, but can't manifest anything but because they're missing the structure. You, so again, it's that, that yin and yang, absolutely. And you know, we've, we've made a full circle and managed to, to 
find ourselves back at this idea of paradox and, and balancing yes. yin and yang. And it seems like that would be a, a great place to, to tie a bow on our, our conversation. Absolutely. But be, before I let you go, I, I got to ask you the question I ask everybody. Yes. And I think I already know what you're going to say, but um, I, I'm, I'm on this, this hunt, this investigation mm-hmm. to identify like what makes a good practitioner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious about your opinion, uh, both teaching uh, as, as an educator, as mm-hmm. a client and patient, as a practitioner. Mm-hmm. What do you think if you were to find like one skill, what's, what's the thing that makes a practitioner good or a skillful? Wow, what a question. I would love to know what you think I'm going to say. We'll see if we match. It's like, <laughs> it's like the dating game, you know? Did you, okay. How well do you know me? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what makes a good... You know, have, there's so much I could say. I think having the ability just to listen. Um, um, in pure presence with no judgment, just listening. I think we're in a, in a culture where we listen with our mind still going. And a lot of us are starving. Many people just want to be heard and seen in. And so I noticed just by seeing and hearing someone in full presence, um, without my mind going, but they can just feel my heart and that. So it's like seeing and and hearing with no mind. And um, when a person feels that, everything starts to shift before the treatment even begins. And I mean, and that's a really hard practice. You know, I I think it's so easy because we're, we're trained as practitioners your, your spidey senses are up. I'm looking for the voice. I'm smelling the smells. I'm hearing their story and I'm trying to put it all together. And so our minds are going, going, going. And then if, if we can just pause and stop that for a moment and just hear with no mind and all, and, and see with no mind, but just see with your heart and that pure presence, I think that, that can change and shift things without inserting a needle or the treatment's done. And then you know, go massage or needle or sound them. <laughs> so, so it looks like <laughs> we can do an exchange, but <laughs> yeah, I would say that that, and that's something I try, I'm working on, you know, in my own life, um, both personally and professionally is just seeing from that place of pure present. And even when the trauma, like, you know, when trauma starts to rise up, really, it just needs to be seen. And once it, like, this is alchemy, once it's seen, it transforms when there's no resistance to what is right. That's a that's such a such a, a, a beautiful answer. Not what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> Close, <laughs> but a very very beautiful answer. So I'm I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, uh, I I really appreciate you uh, you chatting with me. Oh, and, uh, amazing! And I'm, I'm eternally grateful to you uh, as a friend and as a teacher colleague all of that always so, thank yes. you i'm really honored to uh have a chat with you and learn learn with you alongside and and share so thanks again